the spring-summer 2011 collection pays tribute to the long-standing, close collaboration between the great couturier Christian Dior and the illustrator René Gros. Outfit 5, a coat directly inspired by the artist's graphic style, bears witness to this legacy. Paris, Avenue Montaigne, the heart of the Christian Dior Haute Couture Ateliers. Here in the hands of the toilist, who is responsible for making the muslin, the designer's sketches will take shape. Donc là, on reçoit le croquis. Je prépare une toile en tarlatane sur le mannequin que je modèle au mannequin suivant les formes qui me sont données par le croquis. With a simple toile and a stockman dummy, the deuxième man, or the second hand, translates each line and form and imagines the coat's volume. Ensuite, cette toile que je modèle, je la trace et je la réépingle pour avoir la forme générale. Each piece of the toile is indexed and annotated with the direction of the fabric and the cut involved, straight grain or bias. Captioned with meticulous precision, this toile will become the reference, the pattern from which each piece will be cut and the coat constructed. Once reviewed by the premier main or first hand, the toile is presented to the designer. For the first time, he can visualize his design in space. His drawing has taken shape, and thanks to the fitting model, it is now coming to life. In the Gruach-inspired collection in particular, this stage is vitally important. Thanks to a strong play on light, deep shadows are used to underscore the coat's lines and shapes. This is the effect of the collection, broad swaths of color underscored by ink-black lines. Embroideries will adorn these shadows of tulle, evoking the flourish of a brush stroke or a pen. The numbers and shapes penciled on the toile correspond to these separate layers of tulle that will form the coat's shadows. The second hand and the dressmaker start to cut the fabrics, red silk fai, white silk fai, and black tulle. Some parts of the coat will be embroidered, others pleated. The 140 centimeter squares being cut here are to be given to the pleater. This width is needed for the panels in the skirt section of the coat, which features sunray pleats that flare broadly at the bottom. The fabrics go through a host of small operations while the coat is being made. Si on ne prend pas les lisières, le tissu ne va pas rétrécir euh, régulièrement. The coat skirt has no fewer than 16 pleats. Two in white silk thigh, four in red silk thigh, and ten in black tulle. The toile sections to be embroidered are then dismantled for the stage known as threading. The tulle is so transparent and fragile, nothing can be written on it. So the design is threaded in white silk onto the black tulle weave. This technique is only ever used in haute couture. It is a long, fastidious process designed to avoid marking the fabrics when tracing the designs onto them. Le brodeur a besoin d'avoir la forme de la pièce à broder sur le tissu. Donc avec la forme des fils, il va déjà pouvoir reconnaître tout de suite ses morceaux et en plus savoir à quel endroit il doit broder pour que nous on puisse récupérer et bien positionner les, les motifs aux endroits désirés. Another operation is needed to prepare the tulle for embroidery. Et on coupe au carré pour, pour le brodeur pour que ça soit plus facile d'installer sur les métiers pour éviter de déformer les tissus. Autour du tulle, on va mettre une toile, ce qui permettra aux griffes du métier de s'accrocher. Each piece of tulle is prepared and noted with all the information needed to apply the embroidery, the name of each design and its layout on the coat. Le corsage est brodé. 
The pieces of tulle are now ready. The embroiderer comes to the Dior Couture Ateliers for a briefing. The first hand and her second, the toiliste, go all over the details of the embroidery work the designer has asked for on each fabric, point by point. Là, si tu veux, on a notre rouge avec une épaisseur de tulle et après on a un feuilleté. Donc plus, là, on est plus rouge et là, on devient plus noir. Là, tu brodes et là, ça vient en mourant. Là. Toute ta broderie, elle est du côté foncé. Là, je fais de la broderie là. Là, tu en as un petit peu, tu tournes. Ouais. Là, tu tournes un petit peu ici, tu reviens ici sur le dessus et tu reviens ici. Et après, c'est notre panneau plissé de blanc. Foncé. C'est brodé mm. et clair, c'est pas brodé. Back in his studio, the embroiderer explains to his designer the motifs that will need to be reproduced on the tulle. The first step is to reproduce the pattern. He makes sure that the basque and the collar, marked by the thread, exactly match the paper patterns reproduced from the toile. The pieces are then reproduced again on tracing paper. A sample of embroidery, previously validated by the design studio, is laid out to observe its effect. Ça fait ça, ça, ça. Okay, donc à la rigueur, on peut faire les axes. Hein. The embroidery motif on the sample is then drawn onto a sheet of tracing paper. Et là, un truc comme ça. Qui suit comme ça. Ouais, qui suit comme ça. Comme ça. Once the embroidery has been properly positioned, it is traced onto a second sheet of tracing paper. The designer draws standard strokes on one side and colors on the other. She then adds captions with all the information that the embroiderers need. The exact position of each embroidery must now be approved by the Dior Atelier. On démonte ça pour pouvoir voilà. passer nos oui, oui, oui. Ok, ça marche. Et euh, comme ça sera démonté, après tu pourras couper tes ongles. Oui, bien sûr. Voilà, bien sûr. Ce que je fais, change, je démonte un petit peu de la basque. Hein, pour, euh, pour Meanwhile, ça. the toile is dismantled step by step, piece by piece, to draw up the patterns. Each piece, either the original toile or a paper pattern of it, will be carefully drawn onto the fabric to prepare it for cutting. The vast lengths of red silk thigh are cut to form the basques. The large pleats in the skirt, the four flounces, the body and the entire top of the coat. Last come the two pieces of the collar. Ça c'est plat, ça se revient là, ça c'est plat, ça revient là. In haute couture, chalk is rarely used to trace the outlines. Threading is generally preferred. When chalk is used, it is only ever traced on the underside of the fabric. Here the front and right hand side of the jacket are traced on one length of fabric. Individual precision is the key to creating a perfect work. Accuracy is crucial to ensure every piece in this impressive puzzle fits. Taylor is preparing a length of white triple organza. It will be used to interface the collar. Placed at the heart of the coat, this fabric is a reinforcement that will give the garment its hold and stiffness. 
The large black flounces and the front basques are also interfaced with triple organza. Okay. Interfacing is a fundamental stage in the coat's creation. Today, the whole atelier is working on it. For the parts that need a supple hold, simple organza is used as interfacing. The collar and the basques have pronounced stiff shapes, so are reinforced with triple organza. Pre-shrinking involves steam ironing every piece of fabric. Some fabrics shrink when heated. Without regular ironing at the stage, any later work on the coat could be jeopardized because the fabric would have shrunk. For complex forms like the collar, the tailor has fixed the organza to the thigh. Maintenant, je vais commencer à rouler pour donner les deux formes. Là, je vais baguer cette organza, mais je vais placer, je vais déplacer mes épingles parce que maintenant, quand je vais le mettre, je vais le rouler sur le mannequin, ça va bouger. C'est ça la différence avec faire euh, porter la haute couture, c'est que tu t'es calculé euh, d'avance et la haute couture, c'est plus au chic. Ça peut bouger euh, un jour si quelque chose est coupé en billets, euh, le lendemain ça s'allonge donc il faut replacer. Euh, donc tout est fait vraiment à la main, chaque étape, euh, une fois, deux fois, trois fois. Euh. Et la cinquième c'est quoi C'est pour chiquer, ça se trouve, ça changera encore ça. Hein donc surtout ce qui est important c'est que tu es ton premier col ici qui tourne bien comme un col de veste classique. Et ensuite, tu te fais comme une goutte ici, tu vois mm. une, une goutte du revers, parce que le col, normalement, derrière, il tient debout. Enfin, tu le chic hein, pour que ce soit joli. Hein. Oui. These careful placings and adjustments of the fabrics fitted together can take hours. The second hand instructs her team. Nous allons poser les ombres de tulle sur les morceaux. C'est pour avoir l'effet de, de couleur qui diminue en intensité avec l'effet les, le, lumière. Donc euh, sur ton tissu, je t'ai déterminé l'arrêt pour la coupe des tulles. Là où il y a marqué deux tulles, on aura donc le tulle brodé plus une deuxième couche que l'on va poser ici et que tu vas couper dans la forme du petit trait. D'accord. D'accord Ok. Et ensuite, on va avoir le, le, la le broderie tout par voilà. dessus. Alors, si je comprends bien, il faut que je commence par, la, oui, par le oui, 5. Oui, je t'ai expliqué par là, mais il faut que tu commences par le 5. Comme ça, on recouvre, on vient ici, on recouvre, on vient là, on recouvre, on vient là, et le dernier tulle brodé fera Fais la, la dernière la couche. La cinquième épaisseur. The tailor starts rolling the basque on the cushion to interface it with red organza. After pinning the two to the red thigh, the two fabrics are joined together by a tiny invisible stitch. Layer after layer, the gradated shadow effect on the coat starts to appear. Each piece of tulle is pre-shrunk. The humid heat removes the glossy effect and the fabric is stabilized. Here, organza is laid flat over one side of the jacket to interface the thigh. Là, tu te traces. Tu te laisses, on va dire, 3 cm tout autour. 
Après, tu te poses ici, tu t'entoiles comme tu as fait pour l'organza. On se met la basque dans la forme avec la pince pour obtenir le rond. Donc ça, cette partie-là, elle est plate, donc moi, je la laisse tomber. Ouais. D'accord Et après, je fais, là, je fais comme si c'était ma taille. OK C'est ce que je te disais, pas déformé, surtout bien, ouais. bien caressé, dans le droit fil. Et regarde ta basque, elle tombe toute seule. Tu vois Quand tu la poses sur le, la fille, après, elle se met, elle se positionne directement. On the dummy, the dressmaker shapes the pleats in the back of the jacket. She snips the fabric to widen a sleeve for better ease of movement, then pins the fabrics to roll them together. The collar interface with triple organza will now be shaped on the dummy. Here we can see three layers of fabric, but a total of five will be needed to craft the collar. Silk thigh on top, simple organza to add texture to the thigh, triple organza to provide the shape, then another layer of simple organza and a final piece of silk phi on the underside of the collar. Meanwhile, the atelier workers are threading the fabrics for the two large flounces that form large drapes between the basque at the back of the coat. Donc les parties en biais, elles se placent très très bien parce que le biais fait que ça se détend plus et ça, ça, ça roule mieux. The tailor refers to the toile to make the darts in the drape back flounces. This morning, the dressmakers have put a paper pattern under the original muslin and are using a tracing wheel to mark out where the tool will go. Euh, non, je le fais à main levée. Isabelle, tu fais à main levée. Prends pas de pistolet. Le 1 qui est la partie. The pattern is then carefully captioned. Le 2. Le 3 tout seul ici. Le 4 tout seul ici. Après. Le 1, donc lui, on sait qu'il continue tout le temps. Donc on va se retrouver avec une partie 2 ici. Meanwhile, the triple organza interfacing for the basque is being catch stitched to the silk thigh. Catch stitching is commonly used in the tailoring atelier to sew interfacing to fabric and keep it slightly apart from the seams. When the interfacing is cut flush to the stitching, it won't create any extra seam bulk. The tailor is removing his basting, leaving only the outline threading visible. He adds the tulle motifs, then stitches and knots them in place. Once the fabric has been cut and the pattern traced, the toile is reassembled on the dummy, ready to be sent to the embroiderers. Here the embroiderer is submitting the position of each piece for the atelier's approval. Back at his studio, he gives his designer the OK. After a quick wipe down to make sure nothing will catch, the designer lays out two sheets of tracing paper. The motifs on the top sheet are pricked onto the tracing paper below, which will be dusted with chalk. This process allows the designer to trace her drawings onto the tulle with chalk powder. For the time being, she protects the tulle with a piece of hydrosoluble plastic. She can use the canvas border around the tulle to tack the two materials together. The motifs are dusted with chalk and appear on hydrosoluble film. On smaller pieces, they sometimes appear directly on the tulle. The pieces to be embroidered are packed up with the caption tracing paper and taken down to the embroidery studio.
embroiderer fixes the fabric to her loom. She has to make sure the tulle stays perfectly taut to avoid pulling it out of shape, altering its physical properties and jeopardizing its insertion into the coat's folds and seams. These side straps allow her to adjust the tulle's tension. The captions on the tracing paper give her all the information she needs to do her work. She starts by checking that the motifs match. Each color noted on the tracing paper corresponds to a particular bead or sequin, in this case, size three and size five sequins. The embroiderer sets to work with a string of beads and her hook. In the tambour technique used here, called the crochet de luneville, she works blind. She holds her beads and sequins under the loom and hooks the thread through the tulle. Only the knots are made on the surface. She then turns the loom over to check the precision and perfection of her work on the right side of the tulle. After the embroidery for the tulle on the basques, we move on to the embroideries that will adorn the drapes of the flounce. Embroidering single beads is the longest, most fastidious method. Every bead has to be knotted. Before being delivered back to the atelier, each piece of embroidery is steamed. The fabric falls back into shape. The gleaming embroidery is perfectly aligned. Back at the couture atelier, preparations are underway to cut a long bolt of red organza for the interfacing. A dressmaker is assembling the five layers of black tulle that will produce a deep shadow on the left side of the coat. First, the excess fabric is cut away. The edges are cut down to three centimeters from the basting thread which marks the collar rim. A lot of care and attention is needed to shape the collar, but it will only be final once the last two layers, the simple organza and the red silk phi underside, have been basted on. La doublure, elle vient pas au bord du manteau, donc on est obligé de laisser ce qu'on appelle la parmenture. Tulle is basted to a sleeve, then onto a piece of the jacket. The right-hand side of the jacket has been interfaced and refitted onto the dummy. The interfacing has stiffened the silk thigh and the dressmaker can now shape the shoulder, round out the sleeve and form the folds in the back. She rolls the organza and fixes it neatly to the thigh. A flounce interfaced with triple organza is fitted to the dummy's waist. The side pieces of the jacket are being machine stitched to hold the various layers together. The padding of Monsieur Dior is perdure encore. It's really what permits to give the form to the basque du devant. Invented by Christian Dior himself, the paddings are a key feature on the iconic bar jacket, the epitome of the new look. These small padded cushions give the emblematic basques all their shape. I think this is a work that is very specific to Dior. I don't find that in other houses of couture. We glisse it below and we fix it to the size so that the basque remains bien, bien projected like that in front. The basque is unpinned from the dummy to be attached to the flounce. Making the flounces is a complex business because the right side and the underside can both be seen. Over in another part of the atelier, work on the underskirt has started. 
Made in red tulle and edged with horsehair ribbon, it is shaped to give the coat skirt its full volume and flow. The basque is basted to its flounce. Here we can clearly see the catch stitch that keeps the three layers together, silk, red organza, and the white triple organza. The dressmaker removes the basting and gives her piece a quick iron to reshape it, the finishing touch after every stage. On this coat, the sleeves are integrated in the side panels of the jacket. Alors là, on est obligé d'ouvrir le tissu à son maximum parce que notre manteau, c'est ce qu'on appelle une manche kimono. La manche qui est à même les vêtements. Voilà, pour qu'on puisse obtenir cet angle, une fois qu'on a piqué ces deux coutures là, on est obligé de fendre au milieu et puis de surfiler pour pas qu'on ait cette mésaventure qui nous arrive. Some pieces can only be assembled by hand. A piece is fixed under the basques. It's a structural element called a technical basque. It holds all the pleats in the skirt, which are too heavy to be sewn directly to the basque themselves. Slowly and meticulously, the coat jacket is crafted. The excess fabric is notched, then cut. The collar is attached to the jacket. Next comes the painstaking process of fitting the new outfit onto the dummy. The tailor rolls the fabrics, adjusts the sleeve or tweaks the pleats in the back of the jacket. The right sleeve is made of red silk interfaced with organza, but the left is covered in five layers of black tulle. Tricky. The atelier slowly empties. After hours of work, everything is in place, pinned and tweaked. The action now moves to the Maison Lognon pleading studio in central Paris. The Maison Lognon has been working with Dior since the Couture House was founded and is well versed in the stringent demands of Dior Art Couture. For this coat, Outfit 5, Dior has ordered 16 sunray pleats that fan out like a setting sun, a classic house of Dior motif. Le plissé soleil, on dit toujours qu'on donne des pointes car ce sont des quarts de circonférence, c'est-à-dire c'est du tissu qui est pris en plein biais, donc il s'évase. Vous verrez des pentes sur le dessus du manteau, mais la grande partie est à l'intérieur et quand la cliente ouvrira ce manteau, il y aura un effet de flou et une grande euh, élasticité dans le vêtement. Au préalable, nous avons repassé les tissus. On pose la pointe qui est une pente en biais sur le moule que nous avons fabriqué à la maison. Et ensuite, nous les coupons à la dimension extrême du moule Nous refermons les deux épaisseurs. Nous calons avec des bois pour que ça ne bouge pas. Maintenant, ils vont former tous les plis et vous voyez les mains s'agiter de droite à gauche. C'est pour que les plis soient bien rentrés d'une façon identique du haut en bas de la pointe soleil. Nous allons refermer notre papier craft pour ensuite emmener les deux pointes qui viennent d'être faites dans les tubes où elles vont cuire. The pleats will cook for an hour. The temperature depends on the quality of the fabric. The pleats won't be removed from the molds until the following day. The fabric has to cool all night to make sure the pleat will keep its shape all of its life. The red tulle from the underskirt is edged with horsehair ribbon to give maximum shape and spring.
Today, work has turned to the flounces. The atelier has just received the pleats from the Lognon studio. The dressmaker lays the patterns over the pleats to see which parts to keep. Then comes the threading. It marks the contours of the pleats before cutting and keeps the pleated fabrics together before the final stitching. The horsehair ribbon is then sewn to the underskirt. The black tulle and the phi pleats are matched up. The piece is then attached to the technical basque at the waist. One by one, the tulle pleats are fitted onto the phi, then basted. Before being stitched to the skirt, the underskirt is pinned to the waist of another stockman dummy and checked. The House of Dior has individual stockman dummies for each of its haute couture clients, fitted to their personal measurements. All the fabrics cut on the bias have to fall and hang perfectly. The tailor now fits two layers of tulle onto the red silk pleats. A silk facing is prepared for the tulle underskirt. It is stitched to the waist and allows the underskirt to be sewn to the lining of the coat. The seam goes from edge to edge and creates no bulk. The dressmaker helps to check the fluidity of the pleats. Le plissé il est tenu là dessus, pas plus hein. Après ici il n'est pas tenu hein, le plissé hein. Après c'est le, le manteau. Je qui pense là. que la base qu'on craint, il faut la monter là. It's now been 12 days since work started on the coat. Today, the atelier receives the embroidered tools. The embroiderer has come to present his studio's work in person. Alors, le plus long, c'est ça. Tout ça, c'est du cassé. Et quand on casse, ouais. on arrête le fil, on recommence, on arrête le fil, on recommence. Et on va mettre autant de temps à faire ces trois petites choses-là, que tout ça. C'est vraiment bien fini, hein voilà. Donc je pense qu'il va falloir que tu fasses comme ça, pli par pli, ouvrir, et pli par pli, te le caler. The baguette strips embroidered on the tulle pleats have to be perfectly aligned along the pleat ridges. 
Like pencil strokes on a drawing, they are there to accentuate the crisp folds and highlight their every motion. The time has come to fit all the embroidered pieces onto the coat. Applied with care and precision, fine embroidery now adorns each of the darker pieces in the coat, the flounce, the large pleated skirt panels, the basque. The seams on the tulle are all French seams, a clean, fine, single-line stitch. One by one, the tools are put in place. A full vision of the coat is starting to emerge. In a flurry of fabric and excitement, the pieces move to and fro from the table to the dummy. The basque that forms the front panel is being stitched. The coat skirt will be made up of five panels per side, four panels and the basque. A large flat panel is lined with silk pongee. Only the flat panels are lined, not the pleats, which need to be free to move. Je les ai calés uniquement sur les broderies. Les broderies, voilà. Mais voilà, pas après. On a laissé libre en bas. Je me suis battue en bas. Et Très voilà. bien. The dressmaker stitches her flounce. She sews the tulle, the red organza, and the silk fire together with one seam. The triple organza, which gives the front of the flounce its hold, is kept a few millimeters away with a solid catch stitch, seen here in red. The basting threads are removed. Panel after panel, the coat skirt is constructed. At this point, the coat has become so voluminous and fragile that an extra person is needed to help hold it. Lastly, the pieces that make up the bottom of the coat need to be assembled. Here the basque is being pinned to the flounce. The different layers in the coat are so thick, it is getting harder and harder to pin and stitch. The dressmakers assemble the final panels for the skirt. The underskirt doesn't seem to boost the back of the skirt quite as hoped. The pleated red thigh is sewn securely onto the technical basque with a catch stitch. Donc ici on se retrouve avec moins de matière pour monter la taille sur la basque. Ah, Et là, regarde, ça repousse naturellement. Ah, oui. Comme ça, la basque, elle va venir ici. To make sure the skirt pleats fan out to the full, the decision has been made to puff the skirt out further. Ici, ça va bien projeter tes plis, les plis qui partent de là, et puis ça, ça va aider à les soutenir. A row of extra flounces has been made. The pleats are overlapped on a white silk panel to sew them more tightly together. 
Initially, 10 centimeters of pleats were planned at the waist, but this is now tightened to five. The flounces and the large red and dark colored pleats are fixed to the skirt basques. Now only the white silk pleats in the middle are needed. La jupe, l'escargot est bien montée ici, à plat, à plat. et par dessus, on va mettre le panneau blanc. The dressmaker tucks them under the basque and holds them up against the technical basque to measure their length. The skirt is taken off the stockman dummy to be basted. Stitching this many layers of fabric together is a time-consuming, difficult task. Pleats, flounces, basques, and lining, all stitched together with one seam. A zigzag stitch is used to flatten all these layers down. It is cut flush to the seam so that the lining can be folded over and cleanly faced. Every time a new piece is attached, the coat is checked on the dummy to ensure it hangs properly. White threading marks the length of the finished hem. The tailor is working on the top section, finishing off the embroidered tool that covers the whole jacket. For now, he is working on it flat, but soon it will have to be fitted over the red silk jacket. Basting, ironing, fitting, refitting, realigning, restitching again. As the days pass, the full effect of the play on the coat's form and volume appears. The tool is flattened onto the thigh, making it look like one single fabric. The dressmaker separates the thigh from the tool and marks the hemline with a thread, known as oversewing the hem. To make the hem, she machines a tiny zigzag stitch two millimeters from the edge, folds the fabric over, and flattens it with the iron. A classic hem would have been too wide and disrupted the fall of the pleats. She then cuts the fabric just below the seam and presses the pleats back down with the iron. A small piece of organza is attached to the collar as an extra bit of interfacing to make sure it keeps its shape. The first layer of tulle is stitched to the edge of the silk thigh but the other layers are left loose. Now that the undersides of the kimono sleeves are finished, it's time to prepare the tops and the shoulders. Over and over the pleats are ironed to consolidate their shape and stretch the tools. The tools are cut one centimeter from the edge of the thigh and stitched along the entire circumference of the skirt. The tailor bastes the jacket collar and presses the seams. This is to ensure the tool is nicely fixed at the edge of the thigh and can be easily rounded over. The tool would be stitched two millimeters behind the back of the collar to make sure the seam is invisible from the front. Once the collar is properly in place, it is stitched to the jacket. The tailor sews the sleeve inside out, then turns up the cuff to access the tools. Four layers of tulle are stitched together. The five pieces of tulle at the cuff are all layered, each one centimeter shorter than the next. The dressmaker dons the sleeve to give it volume, then fixes the loose tulle to the middle seam. The embroidered tulle is laid on the collar. The folds at the back of the jacket are arranged and pinned. 
Alléger un curbé, c'est voulu. Il ne voulait pas un truc comme ça. Fixing the back folds is time consuming and complicated. The layers of the fabric are so thick and the embroideries and tools so delicate, it takes some crafting to get the desired movement at the back. The facing is stitched to the collar. But what with the collar's complex shape, the embroidered tool cannot be fitted onto the dummy. The jacket section is laid out flat to be basted and readjusted. The lining is fitted inside the jacket. The jacket and skirt have been pinned together and are now being basted with silk cord. This cord is woven with several threads and is virtually unbreakable. Silk cord is very rarely used for basting, but with no less than 18 layers of fabric to stitch together at its thickest point, this coat is an exception. There's just one day to go before the show. Tomorrow, the coat will feature in the Dior Haute Couture collection. The dressmakers embroider the fasteners. The term is brodé, a haute couture word for a fancy stitch that is stronger and more aesthetic than a simple one. A gros grain has been added to the waist to keep the coat securely closed. It supports the skirt, taking its weight off the jacket. The dressmaker puts the pads in the basques, the secret to the iconic shape of the bar jacket. She sews five large, loose stitches that will secure the collar, but leave it free to move. The big day has finally come. At the Musée Rodin, where the House of Dior prepares to show its haute couture collection, a prestigious audience is gathering. Outfit five in a stunning collection of 30 unique creations, the coat is poised to make its entrance. Back at the atelier, all eyes are focused on the last finishing touches. Large loops are stitched to fix the underskirt with no studs. The coat has to be able to flow naturally with the body's movements. Three hours to go, the tension rises. Hair and makeup artists hurry to finish. Now for the ultimate final touch, the label, Christian Dior Haute Couture, the seal of excellence. The coat is ready. It's about to leave the ateliers. After weeks of work, one detail remains, a luxury accessory to heighten the look, to find the flourish of a unique creation. The red crocodile leather belt cinches the silhouette. Out go the basting threads, freeing the tulle pleats tucked into the thigh. The first hand checks that the execution is perfect, translates every stroke of the designer's inspiration. Two hours to go, backstage two. The last details are in motion. The models get ready to be the Dior lady. 45 minutes, dressing. <laughs> 10 minutes, line up. meticulous handiwork, a unique combination of tradition, excellence, and savoir-faire. All this has brought the designer's sketch to life. Outfit 5 offers the world Christian Dior's vision. 
haute couture that exalts and magnifies femininity, forever extending the limits of creation. <laughs>